thanks for joining us today at New Hope. Our hope is that today, the songs, the prayer, and the message help you not only connect with God and us, but give you some new hope to face this next week.
as well with me.
Dressed in his righteousness alone For this I stand before the throne For this I stand before the throne all this I stand before the throne. This is the time that we invite you to pray with us wherever you are, if you're driving, if you're sitting. If you are on your way here for our drive-in church, wherever you are, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for all your blessings. We want to acknowledge all you do in the good times and the bad times. We are thankful for life. We are thankful that we have a community here that we can depend on. And Lord... We have seen what's going on in the world, and, and it's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of tension going on. We turn on the news, and, and we see it on a daily, on a weekly basis. But one thing that, that should give us comfort is the fact that we believe that there is a God out there that is watching everything and that is in control of everything, especially in the times that it feels that it's not the case. Lord, help us trust in you when it doesn't feel like it's possible. But help us find peace, Lord, knowing that you're watching over us. Pray for those who are watching us right now uh, as we move on with our service here today that, that we may all learn something new, that we may find joy, that we may understand your better, understand your love in a deeper way, and, and that this understanding can, can lead us to a more fulfilling life. So bless us this day, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome to New Hope. If you're just started watching us right now, we're glad that you're here with us. I don't know if it's morning, afternoon, or evening where you are, but we're glad that you're taking the time. I think that's always amazing that you're taking the time of your life to be here with us, to be in community here with us, to sing these songs, to learn about something new today. So we're glad that you're joining in today. Now, for the last three weeks, uh, I've started a series called Sunk that has to deal with the vulnerabilities, the temptations that we face in Jesus. Now, if we go back to the beginning of our series, and just as a recap, we talked about how we have been more vulnerable than usual during these last months, this last year, since the pandemic started. It has just not been easy for many of us. And because of everything that goes on, because of all the tensions and all that we go through, we are more vulnerable, and when we are vulnerable, we are more tempted to fall into a life that is unfulfilling. We are tempted to live in ways that we wish we didn't live in that way. Now, how so? What are the temptations that we face during this time? And we went one by one. We saw that in Jesus' vulnerability, when Jesus was baptized and he went to the desert and he was tempted there, we saw how those temptations are very relatable to us because we can understand things about our present circumstance right now. And the first temptation that we went through was a temptation of control. We saw how the experience of Jesus has a huge parallel with the experience of the Israelites when they also went to the wilderness, when they were in the desert for a long period of time. And they were tempted to go back to Egypt rather than heading to the promised land because it was easier to go back to Egypt and having control over their life rather than depend on God's faithfulness and providence. So the temptation of control is something that we learned about uh, two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the temptation of presumption. And we were figuring out that, that in the experience of the Israelites, they were tempted to question God's love and faithfulness after he had already manifested so much evidence of that. But not only that, by their complaints and questionings, they wanted to force God to act according to their wants. And we saw that in Jesus' temptation in the desert, the same thing happened. The devil tempted him to throw himself from a tall building because by doing so, hey, angels will come and protect you. But by doing so, Jesus would be forcing God to act. He would not be acting by faith, but he would be acting by presumption. And we learned that, uh, that faith is when we trust that God is going to do his will in our life. While presumption is when we assume that God is going to do our will. So in these past weeks, in these past months, since the pandemic started, I think more than usual, uh, we have been tempted to have control. We have been tempted to have presumption. But now we get to the end of this series and going heading to the last temptation of Jesus. There is so much that we can learn as well. But before I start, let me just have a quick word of prayer with you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to read the Bible, to have an open heart and an open mind to be challenged and help us use this opportunity well, Lord. And, and may we end the day today reflecting on these things and, and maybe leading, making the decision to lead a more fulfilling life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So very well, if you are at home right now, if you have a Bible, pick up your Bible right now and open in the Gospel of Matthew. That's the first book in the New Testament. And if you don't have a Bible by any chance, you can follow along here at the screen. We're going to dive into this third temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness and see how we can relate to that. The text start in the following way. Next, the devil took him, took Jesus to the peak 
of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. So one thing that I I think I should mention from the start is the fact that the text emphasizes that Jesus' adversary, Satan, he takes Jesus to a a high mountain. And we see here that he wants worship. It's just very interesting how this story um, moves on because in the Old Testament, uh, in the life of the Israelites, as God was trying to teach them faithfulness, the temptation of the Israelites had always been to have idols. They had different kinds of idols. They saw in the neighboring cities different kinds of idols that they were attracted to. And this kind of worship of these idols took place in the high mountains. That's why you, when you're reading the Old Testament, if you ever had a chance to read it, but if you're not, you, you're going to see this, that when you're reading, it says that king after king from Israel, uh, he, you know, he did good or he did bad, but he did not remove the high places. He did not remove the high places. Why? Because the high places were places of idolatry. So it's interesting how in this temptation of worship, Satan takes Jesus to a high place. Jesus is in his vulnerability, right? It's already the third temptation. Jesus has been without food for 40 days. And he says, I will give this all to you. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I will give this all to you if you will bow down and worship me. Now, the challenging thing about reading the Bible is that, especially when you're trying to prepare a message to speak, one thing for me, at least, is that I, I don't like to ignore the difficult parts. Because we grow up, at least I grew up in the church, and you hear these stories since you were little. And, and for some reason, we just assume that, yes, it's a temptation. You know, the temptation to bow down and worship his enemy, that was a temptation. But, but if you think about it, how was that a temptation, right? In, in many ways, it, it's hard for me. It has been hard for me always to, to have an understanding of why is that so. Jesus had just been baptized and he received a confirmation from heaven that you are my beloved son. God is speaking to him. You are my beloved son. Jesus was very much aware of his mission. Even in the end, after Jesus dies and resurrects, he says that all authority has been given to me. The same authority. Uh, Satan is offering him authority. Hey, I can give all of this to you. But in the end of the Gospels, you see Jesus saying, "Uh, this has already been given to me. So the question is, how is that a temptation? And and it's, maybe I do not have the answer for that. It's something that we have to continue be searching for. But something for us to realize that sometimes uh, the fact that we call it temptations is just maybe because of the way that the, the, the history has told these stories. But are they really temptations? It's something for us to think about. Now, how is the answer that Jesus gives Satan regarding this temptation, if you want to call it a temptation? Was Jesus vulnerable enough that he would bow down and worship his enemy? For me, at least, reading this story, it seems more of a desperate move from the part of Satan than anything else, right? He wants that attention. He wants that so bad that right now he's not even making sense anymore. How would the Son of God, Jesus himself, to came, that came down to this earth for a purpose of giving his life for, for all of us, why would he do such a thing, right? It shows more desperateness from the side of the tempter than anything else. And Jesus says, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus knew very well that this is crazy, right? What you're saying is just crazy. God is the only one who deserves our worship. He's the only one who we should serve. Now, the text ends by saying that the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. But the question remains after each temptation, and the question that I ask you once again is, what is this temptation all about? See, 
even if this was not a temptation in the sense for Jesus because it was so clear of his mission and where he should stand, it's interesting how the temptations that we have seen so far are relatable to us because we are not Jesus. We are different. We, we did not come to this world to save the world. We are human. We are frail. Jesus was human for sure, but we cannot look at Jesus in that way. Now, for us, we can relate to this temptation because just like control, presumption, in this one right now, we will see that it was part of the history of the Israelites and it's part of our story as well. But once again, we can look to Jesus as the source of how to respond to this reality because he has been victorious in all things. And that should always be the example that we follow. Now, the word that is focused here on the temptation is worship. And Jesus responds that worship is only for God, that we should only serve God. And he, and he's text, uh, he is quoting a text from scripture that is found, some say it's found in Deuteronomy chapter six, but it can also be found in Deuteronomy chapter 10. For me, chapter 10 is more interesting because chapter 10 of Deuteronomy is following chapter nine that talks about an incident of the Old Testament of the experience of the Israelites when they were in the wilderness and they worshiped a golden calf. So God is reminding them of what they did. And when he comes to chapter 10, because chapter 10 of Deuteronomy is God speaking to the people through Moses, he says, you must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. And it says, he alone is your God, the only one, the only one who is worthy of your praise. So Jesus has this in mind. Jesus knew the scriptures and he mentions this text knowing that God is the only one who deserves our worship. So as I mentioned, what was the experience of Israel? Remember how every temptation that Jesus faced has a parallel with the experience of Israel. The experience of wanting to have control. They were hungry and they wanted to go back to Egypt where they had control. Then the second one, the Israelites have thirst and they start acting in presumption rather than faith. But God, once again, provides water for them. And as the story continues, they get to a point where God gives them his law, his, his will for them to follow, to live a more fulfilling life. And they say, everything you say, God, we will do. And after that, Moses goes up the mountain. Moses was the prophet, was the leader of the Israelites. He goes up the mountain and he stays there for 40 days. And during the time that Moses is there for 40 days, people become impatient. The Israelites are impatient. It, it, it's hard to live life in this way, depending on God in this way. And they say, you know, we are tired of waiting. And they ask Aaron, which was Moses' brother. He says, Aaron, can you help us here? We're tired of waiting. We want to make a God for ourselves. So they take away all their jewelry, all the gold that they had, and they make a golden calf and they make an idol according to their wants. Now, what's interesting about this whole story is that throughout the Bible we see that the creation of idols is pretty much a creation of a God according to our own image. Because when you have a God that you've created, you have control over that God. It goes in complete clash with what God wants for us, right? Because God is our God and he creates us in his image. We are created in God's image, but when it comes to the idolatry, we build gods according to our own image, according to our wants, according to our control. So we see that th this temptation is very much connected to the first one of control because by worshiping this idol, they were pretty much worshiping themselves because it's about what they want and what they could control. So we cannot ignore this part of the story where the Israelites get impatient and they start moving away from God and start moving towards this idolatry, but in the end of the day becomes this idolatry of self. 
Now, what is the experience of Jesus? See, Jesus faced this temptation of having to bow down. Satan promised him to give all the kingdoms of the world, all the authority. And how does Jesus respond? Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Away from here, Satan. I don't want to hear that. Now, it's interesting that that phrase from Jesus, get behind me, Satan, or, or get away from me, Satan, appears once again in the Gospel of Matthew. And that happens in a very interesting part of the story. Uh, Jesus is sharing with his disciples that he is going to suffer and die. That the reason why he came to this world was to suffer and die. That the road to the cross was a hard one, but it was going to be a reality. That he did not come to this world for, for attention, for to build an earthly kingdom that will only stay here. No, no, no. Jesus is telling them that, that the reason why he is here is for the kingdom of God, which starts here in this earth, but, but will move beyond to a climatic way when Jesus comes back again. So Jesus is trying to tell them these things. But Peter, his disciple, he says, Jesus, stop the nonsense. Uh, this is not going to happen to you. Peter has this mindset that, hey, I like what's going on here. Jesus is becoming this celebrity. Jesus is seen by many as a powerful person. And hey, I'm one of his disciples. Isn't it great to be part of this group? Isn't it great for us to establish a kingdom here in this earth, to destroy the Romans, to find freedom in that way and have power in that way? Peter's eyes are in this reality of an earthly kingdom where self will be uplift, uplifted rather than God. So how does Jesus respond to Peter? Jesus says, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. And he's talking to Peter. And it's interesting because it's the same thing. And why it's the same thing? Because it's the same temptation, right? The temptation of compromise, the temptation of being distracted from the focus of the kingdom of God and establishing a kingdom for self. Jesus continues. He doesn't just say, get away from me, Satan. He says, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. Now, when Jesus is saying this, he's trying to explain that to be a follower of Jesus is to live a life of selflessness. I think in many moments we, we realize that when we read this text about carrying a cross, we have a tendency many times, and I have made the text about me as well in the sense of we try to take the text about carrying a cross and we make it about us. Like I have to carry a cross, something that is only related to me, uh, and the text is not talking about that. If you think about what the cross meant, Jesus carried his cross on his way to give his life for us. The cross is a symbol of giving. The cross is a symbol of selflessness. So Jesus is trying to educate his disciples by saying, if you want to be my disciple, you need to live a life of selflessness. You need to follow me in this road that leads to selflessness. So we see a comparison here, a clash here between two kingdoms. The kingdom of self, the kingdom where I dictate the rules, and it's founded on principles that are contrary to God's will. And this kingdom is by contrast in clash with the kingdom of God, which is founded in selflessness, which is founded in a life of giving, in a, in a life of love. The temptation of establishing the kingdom of self is what this third temptation is all about. We went through the temptation of control, we went through the temptation of presumption, and now it's the temptation to establish the kingdom of self. See, the kingdom of self is selfishness. The kingdom of God has everything to do with selflessness. The kingdom of self is pride. The kingdom of God focuses on humility. The kingdom of self leads to apathy. The kingdom of God is empathy. 
The kingdom of self leads to greed. The kingdom of God, generosity. The kingdom of self leads to hostility. The kingdom of God leads to reconciliation. The kingdom of self leads to resentment. The kingdom of God offers forgiveness. Kingdom of self leads to indifference. Kingdom of God leads to love. Kingdom of self is being distracted from our purpose here in this world. Why are we here? Why do you do the things that you do? Why have you chosen the career that you have chosen? What guides your decisions of everyday life? Do you understand the purpose of why you are here in this world? Kingdom of self is being distracted from our real purpose. The kingdom of God is awareness of God's love towards us in the desire to extend that love to others through action. Henry, Henry Nguyen writes that it's easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. Easier to own life than to live life. And once again, we're not saying that this journey is an easy one. But I'll be honest, it's not easy as well carrying the burdens that we, many of us carry as well. We have to choose what direction to walk, right? We can choose to remain in this vulnerable state or we can choose to be vulnerable towards God and allowing him to take over as we have studied so far. Now the question that I have for you is, how do we move beyond this kingdom of self? Because maybe you're thinking right now, I understand everything you're saying. I have my difficulties, and, but what do I do? You know, what do I do? And that's the challenging thing, right? Because uh, as people are commenting during this series and sharing their thoughts about what we have been studying so far, I usually tell them that, hey, when I'm preparing a message for you to, to watch, I'm preparing a message for myself. The temptations that we see here so far to establish this kingdom of self is the temptations that I have on a daily basis. So you're not alone. Don't ever feel like you're alone. Because when we feel that way, we don't talk about it. We isolate ourselves in our corner and we feel that we are the worst person in the world. But we need to realize that we are a family. And the more we share, the more we understand our vulnerability, we can find support, we can find solutions, and we can be heading in the right direction that leads to freedom. But how do we move? How do we move beyond the kingdom of self? Now, Jesus eventually said to, his, to some of the disciples and some people that were with him, that had believed in him, and we find this saying in John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. See, Jesus was talking to people who had believed in him. If you believe, that's great. But there's something that is important after you believe, and that is remaining. I know that many times we could just be focused on this one-time event. Maybe it's a Saturday or a Sunday whenever you go to church, and maybe you, you go there for, for this spiritual insight, and then after that's over, you move on with your life as if nothing is ever happening, right? Right? And it's interesting, I, I heard once about this concept of, of the Christian atheism, right? Because it's like this. The Bible, when it's talking about atheism, it does not describe atheism as not believing in God. When the Bible talks about the person that does not know God, it talks about someone who lives as if God does not exist. In other words... It's very possible for us to believe in God, to know all these things, to go to church since we were little kids, but be an atheist in this sense of the word, right? Because we live our life as if God does not exist. And when we live for the kingdom of self, right, according to the principles that we have just seen right now, it is as if God does not exist, right? This lack of acknowledgement, 
But Jesus says, but if you remain faithful to my teachings, and what are these teachings? Jesus focused so much time in talking about love, in talking about selflessness, in talking about forgiveness. These are challenging things. Don't get me wrong. It's, very, it's much easier to believe in something theoretical than to actually live out the principles of the kingdom. So nobody is saying here it's easy. It's a journey and sometimes it takes a lifetime. Jesus says, but if you remain faithful to my teachings, it says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now what is the truth? I think the better question is who is the truth? Jesus himself says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So when Jesus says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, Jesus is pretty much saying, if you remain faithful to my teachings, you will know me. You will know my heart. You will know my will. You understand how to live life in a more fulfilling way. And when you take steps towards that direction, this truth, you putting your trust in me will make you free. There is freedom in knowing Jesus. And in this relationship that we can develop with Jesus, it sets us free from our compulsion to be seen, praised, and admired, and it frees us for Christ who leads us on the road of service. Now, as I just mentioned to you, to you that these temptations are my temptations. And, and one thing that I have found very helpful is to use opportunities. Every opportunity that presents itself as an opportunity to make it right. If you have seen yourself as not being a forgiving person, when the opportunity comes to forgive, take that step forward. If you have not been a caring person, if you have not been a loving person, if you have been a greedy person, when the opportunity comes to live in a different way, take that opportunity. It's the baby steps. It's little by little. It's a journey, and it's a journey full of ups and downs. But we need to be reminded that we cannot do it alone that we have a God who loves us, that looks at us, that is offering his hand to walk us through the whole process. You don't have to do it alone. Trust in the God that is watching over you and that cares for you and that is wanting to offer you a more fulfilling life and freedom. So, temptation of control, temptation of presumption, temptation of building a kingdom of self. By contrast, God is inviting you for a life of dependence on him, letting go of control, finding freedom in him, a life of faith, allowing him to take over. And finally, inviting God to our life so that he may change our hearts so that we can leave the kingdom of self behind and walk into the principles of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. If this is your desire right now, to make those changes in and to reflect on these things, knowing that in every decision that you make right now, God is not going to love you less. I invite you to pray with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you do. The road of the cross is a challenging one. The road that leads the kingdom of God is not an easy one. But Lord, you know our hearts. You know that it has not been easy to live under these circumstances. Trying to seek control, living in presumption, kingdom of self, these are things that just weigh us down. So help us, Lord, find the freedom that you were wanting to offer us every single day and that we may find peace knowing that you went through it all You've seen it all, and you can help us along the way. Bless us this day, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
May God bless you. Join us tomorrow at our Garden of Hope. The Garden of Hope provides fresh produce to our food pantry. We're getting our garden ready for the growing season and we could use your help. So join us every Sunday, weather permitting, at 9 a.m. You can register at this link. Families, we want to remind you to take advantage of the resources available for you online and you may access those here. Middle schoolers, join us for a bonfire FNL here at the Church Lawn on Friday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Be sure to register here. Join us in lifting up the class of 2021. If you're a graduating 8th grader, 12th grader, or college student, we want to celebrate you. Go to this link to be part of a special social media post and to receive a gift. Then on Saturday, June 5, the day we're calling Elevate Day, you'll officially move on up and be welcomed into the next ministry, whether that's moving on up to the high school ministry as a graduating eighth grader, college age ministry as a graduating 12th grader, and so on. The deadline to register at this link is next Tuesday, May 18th. High schoolers, just a reminder that Backyard FNL is happening again next Friday, May 21 at 7 p.m. Be sure to register at this link, which is required for all attendees for contact tracing purposes. Then the following night on Saturday, May 22 at 8 p.m., join us for a movie night under the stars, weather permitting. Be sure to bring a blanket or camping chair to sit on, your own snacks, and of course, mask and social distance. And we'll also be providing some individually packaged snacks and drinks as well. You can find out more and register here. Our pantry is still going strong. We have been feeding around 400 people every week, but there is still more we can do with your help. If you want to be involved in this beautiful initiative, you can come shop and deliver groceries, help stock the shelves, pick up needed supplies, or provide financial support. You can find out more information at this link. Join us next week as we start a new series looking at when prayer doesn't always make sense. Join us then.